morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. It's a great morning. (coughs) We've woken up. Well, we're here in a very special place. We're not in our usual garden or area, are we? No, we're not. We're in a place called Wakelands Farm, which is on the Norfolk Suffolk border, just in Suffolk. And we've come here to learn a bit more about agroforestry. It's certainly paying dividends already. I woke up this morning and I heard a bird that I hadn't heard for years, <coughs> let alone lying in my bed with the window open. I didn't know. I was, I was still asleep. Yes, you were still asleep. You missed a turtle dove. I know. Turtle dove. You should have woken me up. I know. Listen, 95% <laughs> decline since 1970. You've got to grab mm. them when you can. And this you is do. one of the few places that they're, really they're hanging on here. Yeah, it's an amazing place. Here. The biodiversity here is just incredible. You know, we're just walking around the birds of going crazy. All we had sorts. a munchak this morning, which was quite nice. Munchak, really munchak, close, didn't we? Have, yeah. yeah. There's yeah. black cap singing here. I had a garden warbler earlier as well. I've got a bit of fog in my throat, haven't I? Yeah, you this, 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 this. <laughs> I've gone a bit grass. <coughs> well, we both had a, a, some nice bird experiences this week, haven't we? Well, I went and I was um, serenaded by a nightingale on Tuesday night up until about two in the morning. It was singing a metre yeah. above my yeah. head. Nightingales I just realised you're going to win the bird week. Yeah, I'm going to win the bird week. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm playing hard. My turtle I'm, doves start getting knocked into turtle third, doves great. third place. But, you know, I did have a nightingale singing a metre above my head for the mm. best part of an hour. Yeah. And that was with Sam Lee with Nightingale's event, which was, I have to say, one of the best wildlife experiences I've ever had in the UK. Yeah, okay, go on, let's get to the crunch. Oh, no. Oh, yesterday. (laughs) Oh, yesterday, uh, I was filming for Spring Watch, which starts on Tuesday, Um, but I I got to go and um, handle and be part of the captive breeding programme of Corncrakes. I'm not jealous. I'm not jealous. Corncrakes. Not jealous. Yeah, it was good. But everything Max is talking about is pertinent to what we're going to be talking about today. Today, we're talking about the state of nature in the UK and a petition that we have launched, which we're hoping that we can encourage you to sign by the end of our hour-long broadcast today. Because all of the things that you're talking about, the recovery of the corn cakes, yeah, here, people breeding. you know, looking after their turtle doves, show that we have the capacity to restore, repair, and recover our landscape and the species that live in it. But very sadly, um, it's not in the state that we would like it to be in. So before we kick off and we've got a great range of guests coming up this morning telling us about the projects that um, that they have been doing to make a difference but also telling us about their concerns that uh, we all need to work a lot harder to make sure that that difference counts and uh, most notably of all this morning the focus of our campaigning our, our government now not just our current government but our future governments because we're going to be asking them to put into law a very robust structure to ensure the protection of the wildlife that we've still got and the recovery of that which we are losing or have lost. So that's our purpose this morning. So do stay tuned. As I say, we've got some excellent speakers and some really fantastic projects that are running. But look, let's before we get on to it, let's yeah. hit the nail on the head. Um, the State yes. of Nature reports have been published for some time now, and they are an ongoing um report put together through the extraordinary work of volunteers, um, able volunteers who go into the field and record uh, notable species, basically terrestrial and freshwater in the main uh, across the UK, from which we can gather comparative data. And we've really got that comparative data in a really good form yeah. since 1970. And I'm afraid that the news is, is not good. Um, 13 percent uh, declines in 696 monitored species since 1970 and a further six percent decline in 2009 that doesn't sound too bad does it 13 percent and six percent well it sounds pretty bad it's not but, great every but, percent you know every point matters isn't it yeah but then when you look more in in more detail you see that our butterflies since 1976 are down by 16 percent and our moths by large moth species by 25% since 1970. And you've got to think about the repercussions of that. If we're losing our butterflies and our moths, those moth larvae are, you know, very important food for lots of other other things, everything from small mammals to, to birds to, to bats in, yeah. in, in the adult form, of course. And the really grim news is that the State of Nature report, the last one that was published in 2019, showed that 15% of UK species are threatened with extinction. 15%. Now that's a very notable and significant percentage of animals and plants that are threatened with extinction. And 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 most troubling of all, 41% are are in serious decline since the 1970s. So that's I mean without generalizing too 
you know, mm-hmm. easily. 41 is nudging 50%. That's half the species monitored in the UK have been in decline since the 1970s. We did have some targets set by the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity for biological diversity. They were set by governments for 2020. Um, It saddens me to tell you that very few of those targets were met. We didn't meet those targets that we set. Um, The other good news, well, there is some good news, and that is that um, we've got 40% 40 more of those volunteers going out into the field, actively working uh, to monitor or conserve wildlife since 2000. So that's probably many of you who are watching. More connection, there's more kind of... I don't know, particularly the last year, everyone's really connected with wildlife and nature, isn't it? So I bet, hopefully, that statistic's going to go up even yeah. more. And, and, and please, if you, you know, if you might be a member of the NGOs, many of whom we'll be speaking to this morning, um, paying, your, paying your annual subscription is great, but getting involved is even greater. Um, your skill set, your energy, your endeavours, your abilities are invaluable to us in the UK, and conservation wouldn't be working at all without its volunteers. So a 40% increase since 2000 is really good, but what isn't quite so good is that since its peak in 2008 and 9, public sector spending um, has declined by 42%. Again, that's nearly 50% of our public sector spending has disappeared in, in, in basically the last 10 or 11 years. Now, when you contrast that with the fact that we've got these catastrophic declines, surely what we should be doing is spending more public money for public good when it comes to nature, biodiversity, landscape richness, mm. quality of life, and so on and so, so forth. There's lots going on. I mean, the UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in Europe. I mean, it just going out and because something looks green doesn't necessarily mean that it's good. You know, we have to take a really critical look at what's there. And these reports are so, so important. But ultimately, what's going on? You know, why are we the country, you know, one of the worst countries for nature? And there's a whole load of different reasons for that. Of course, intensive farming is a huge problem. The use of pesticides, glyphosate, for example, coming in into freshwater ecosystems. We know that we've lost 90% of our freshwater ecosystems in the UK in the last 100 years, um, which is just an astonishing figure. One third of freshwater species are facing extinction, and it's the most rapidly declining habitat of all as our freshwater ecosystems. Yeah, 0%, 0% of our rivers are in good condition and if you want to monitor that I suggest you follow the one and only Mr Fergal Sharkey on uh, on his social media on Twitter he's a great place to learn about what's going on and this last week we've had a lot of rain in various places and if you yep. look on um, on on his uh, social media feeds he'll be reporting on all sorts of sewage leaking into mm-hmm. our river systems agricultural uh, waste leaking into mm-hmm. our river systems causing all mm-hmm. sorts of damage so there's no doubt yeah. that that's part of the problem then we've got things like like just flagrant destruction, yes. things like HS2, oh. ploughing through many sites of wildlife importance, nature reserves, ancient woodland, so on and so forth. And again, we're not here to, to, to bang on about the ills of HS2 we could, in particular. But, yeah, it's we merely <laughs> an example of, of a development uh, which is causing that sort of destruction. Yeah. Um, urbanisation, we've got to say. Urbanisation, development, habitat fragmentation. I mean, there's lots of different avenues, but they're not mutually exclusive of one another. You know, we're very keen to you know blame one problem on one reason, but they are all interlinked and they are as i said not mutually exclusive so we do have to look at these problems as a collective um, and figure out way, ways forward but i mean it's amazing climate change it? we haven't climate, mentioned of course obviously the one of the most one. significant of all the looming it's you know ever looming isn't it increasingly significant yeah. and um you know, increasingly worrying, but there's still lots of solutions that we can do to to mitigate those impacts. And I mean, what I always find amazing is we talk about how much we love species, and we've got our favourites, haven't we? We've got our favourites. I mean, I like a water vole myself. Do you like a water vole? I do. Well, I, yeah. I I do, but I just don't see them in the abundance that mm-hmm. I did when even when I was your age, yeah. and certainly when I I was younger. Yeah. Well, they're not there anymore because ninety four percent of the habitats that they used to exist, they're no longer there, and ninety four percent of the habitats that they used to exist. In. You know, they've, they've disappeared. And we've got the other problem we've got there is non native introductions of North American, you know, and North American mink. Yeah. American yeah, mink have come exactly. in and they again have had a negative impact. So, mm. what you can see from you know, this lament that we're rolling out at the moment is that there are, as you say, a plethora, 
plethora of problems mm -hmm. which collectively are putting an enormous pressure on the UK's mm -hmm. uh, biodiversity. We've mentioned already, you know, turtle dove this morning. Yes. A bird that was once. Do you know, I found when I was, when I was a kid. Well, yeah, there it is. Number one. When classic, I was a kid, classic I found a turtle dove's Chris. nest in yeah. our school grounds in Did Southampton. You? 1972 oh, no. that would have been right 1972 I'm quite, I, you know. I do not I don't know whether I've ever seen a turtle dove nest no I don't think you have no I don't think I ever have that's sad isn't it that's really sad well, it makes me sad it makes me really mm. sad lapwings again another species yeah. that were you know familiar in the fields around Southampton where I grew up and it was nothing in springtime to go out and find a few lapwings nest and then go back and find those beautiful little fluffy chicks and the adults would be wheeling overhead with that very characteristic uh, call. Red squirrels. Oh, they're the cutest. I mean, and they're the little tufts and very sweet. But again, you know, a product of invasive species coming in, grey squirrels coming in and, you know, habitat destruction. And unfortunately, red squirrels have massively declined to a few patches. You know, some in Scotland, we've got the Isle of Wight, for example. But they're, you know, they're not where they should be. Not where they should be. No. So what are we going to do about it? Because frankly, no. the option is not to sit back and do nothing any longer. We've reached a critical point, as all the statistics uh, that we've outlined have, have pointed out, and the fact that we need more public sector funding. And there are an enormous number of people out there working very, very hard. Long ago, mm -hmm. long ago this morning, they set their alarm clocks. Yep. They're out in the fields, they're digging Monitoring. ditches, they're putting in fences, they're counting this, that and the yeah, other. Writing on their uh, clipboards. They're, they're, writing on the clipboards. They're, they're doing all sorts of things. They're lobbying and they're doing what they can. And uh, one body that's behind all of this is Wildlife Countryside Link. Uh, and it's an umbrella organisation that looks after lots of NGOs and represents their yep. collective concerns. Uh, is yeah, I like a very collaboration is point so of focus. important. Yeah. Collaboration, NGOs coming together with a shared purpose, shared missions is the most important thing. We need collective thinking. We need not lots of different groups doing similar things, but separately. We need all those groups to come together on a collective mission. And that's what Wildlife and Countryside Link you know, yeah. tries to do. I'm very pleased brilliant. to say that Richard Benwell uh, from Wildlife Countryside Link is going to join us now. Richard, good morning. Good morning, Megan. Good morning, Chris. Hello. Hi, thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, before we get started, Richard, I gave a very brief pricey of what Wildlife Countryside Link is about. Tell us a little more. We are a coalition of um, all of those household name charities that you've heard of fighting for nature. Uh, so there are 60 organisations working together and nature doesn't care whether you've got a, a badger on your badge or an avocet or an oak leaf. The important thing is we all speak with one voice and we're doing that. We're telling government what they need to do to improve the state of our natural environment. So we work for animal welfare, for natural environment and for people's enjoyment of nature. OK, mm. and, and we've started off with a, a catalogue of statistics which are very frightening. Megs has already admitted she's never seen a turtle dove's nest. She slept through the bird this morning. But this week, uh, you know, she's been involved in some very, um, you know, good hopeful conservation yeah. programs um th th we're not beyond hope at this point are we the, the, it's still worth getting up and, and putting in a good fight for nature isn't it it surely is i mean we know we're reaching some pretty scary tipping points so there's a point beyond which nature simply won't recover if you get to those horrible thresholds of destruction you can lose entire ecosystems but we're not there yet i mean this whole pandemic has been a warning from the world that our relationship with nature is broken uh, and it's increasing the chances of things like zoonotic disease but we still have a chance to fix things and that's why at the moment we're campaigning to get the government to set not just a a nice policy recommendation to save nature that we've heard so often we want a firm binding law to say that government will take the action that's needed to finally turn around the state of nature by 2030. Well, last week, wasn't it, there was an announcement made that the government wanted to halt biodiversity decline by 2030. I mean, it sounds promising. I, you know, it sounds good. I mean, I'd like it to stop, you know, 2021. And, um, you know, these things are always <laughs> years off in the distance, but still it's something, isn't it? I mean, how optimistic are you and how should we be pushing forward with this? There's been a lot of news this week. I mean, just yesterday, the G7 came together and issued a communique to say that those powerful nations, US, Japan, Canada, Italy, Germany, um, France, that we would stop biodiversity decline by 2030. And probably your young viewers are thinking, yeah, we've done it. At last, the big guys are speaking and we're going to sort it. 
but probably your older viewers are sitting there going, God, here we go again. Because we've had these promises before. As Chris mentioned, uh, 10 years ago, the world got together and promised to halt biodiversity decline. And you said not many of the targets were met. In fact, not a single one of the HE targets was met when the UN issued its report last year. So it is important when you get these big announcements, but why have we failed? It's because those international pledges haven't been converted into domestic law, the kind of law where if a government doesn't do what's needed, you can take them to court and you can sort it out. You can make them issue a new plan. You can make them increase that public funding. And that's the difference we're looking for this time. So Mr. Eustace, the Environment Secretary has said this week that that's what they'll do in the Environment Bill. They'll set a binding law to stop nature's decline by 2030. And that's why we really need to keep up the pressure now to make sure that, that get, law gets on the page in the best form it possibly can and is fully enforceable. And it's happening because already loads of people, loads of NGOs and loads of campaigners have got together and campaigned for this to happen, not just this year, but over six, eight, ten years to say we need a, a law for nature. Uh, and this time, I think it can really happen if we stick with it and get behind it. Uh, Richard, the, the drafts of the law um, are, are in progress, obviously, but what we've seen recently in other pieces of legislation which relate um, perhaps less directly to, to nature is that there are loopholes left in those laws. Um, we've seen this when it comes to planning, for instance, which can have a, uh, an enormous impact on our natural environment. You know, it's, it's going to be hard work, isn't it, to make sure that no little loopholes are left so that, you know, there are escape routes, basically, which will allow the destruction rather than the recovery of the nature that we love so much. It it's surely is. Um, on the one hand, we get good things. On the other hand, they get taken away. So you know, th this week's announcements about nature are really good. And we've got to applaud the government for that. But it's not long since they issued a new planning white paper, which would have stripped away loads of the planning reforms to actually stop destructive development from squishing the nature all around us. Uh, and so the thing we need to really make sure happens this time is that that law isn't just about the environment department, it can reach out to every bit of government and say, are you doing your bit? Treasury, are you investing in nature? Planning department, are you thinking about how we build our communities in a way that builds nature into the, the fabric of the places we live? Health department, are you out there making sure that people are getting nature-based prescriptions to help us improve our mental health and get our, enjoy our phys the physical benefits of connecting with nature? And the important thing is that's what we've seen with the Climate Change Act. So a decade ago, when we set the Climate Change Act and that legally binding target, it has started really to have an effect all across government. So with things like uh, the, the victory on um, uh, Heathrow Runway, uh, the, the victory on the Cumbria coal mine, um, with the investment that's going into offshore renewables uh, in the business department, those have happened because there's a target that applies across the whole of government to make them happen. So it might seem abstract, it might seem like a, a thing that doesn't connect to the real world, but if we get this right, it'll filter down to make sure that those real world decisions go the right way for nature. I think the other thing, Richard, is that once we get those laws on paper, we need to make sure that they're enforceable. There will be plenty of people, I imagine, screaming at the screen at the moment saying, well, look, hold on. We've got adequate protection for things like bats and badgers. Um, it's meant nothing when they've been in, in the path of HS2 or, or closer to where we are sat at the moment, the Wensum Link Road, which is now posing a serious threat to colonies of Barbastel bat, one of the rarest species in the country, a protected species. Um, those are the sorts of sort of I don't know if they're legal, but they're certainly moral and ethical loopholes where, you know, governments seem to be able to ride roughshod over their own legislation when it suits them to do so. And that's not something that we should allow to happen, is it? It's, it's not. And enforceability and getting out there and working with the law is so important. I mean, you're part of Wild Justice, Chris, uh, an organisation that uses the law to close those loopholes. Uh, and... It's, it's so important that when we get this, if we get this, if people get behind us, the, the work doesn't end there. That's where we need to start making sure that for every decision that goes out there that looks like it's going the wrong way, we use this powerful 
legal mallet, basically, to push the government back into compliance. And I think at the moment they're really trying to do the right thing. Um, but when other interests come in, you know, when, when there are short term economic problems or um, uh, business voices asking for other things, it's in those moments that the law is there to back us up. And whether it's client earth or wild justice or, or just an individual thinking about what terrible destruction somebody's wreaking down the road from them, it's up to us to make sure that we use the law to its full effect to make sure that this actually happens. Yeah. And, 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 and just one thing, Richard, we have to clarify here when we're talking about the government, which is the current government, of course. But in order for this to work, we're talking about governments, aren't we? It's not just the one we've got at the moment. It's those that we're going to have for the foreseeable future. Exactly. And it's worth saying, actually, that there are champions for nature on all political parties. And this law has only happened now because there have been people from um, across the political spectrum campaigning for it for a long time. Um, but the point is, if we get this law, it lasts beyond this parliament. It's not a promise that comes and goes with this particular administration. It's there on the statute book and whoever wins in the next election will be bound to it in the same way. I should say it's England this will apply to. Um, so we need to make sure that um, hopefully other similar initiatives are happening all around the UK. So that as a um, as four countries of the UK, we can do our bit to contribute to global improvement. And so what can people do then, people that are watching that, you know, sometimes this kind of stuff is overwhelming, particularly when it gets into policy, which can be complicated at times, new laws and lobbying governments. But what can people do right now to help make a difference? Yeah, it, it, I mean, it does get really techy and silly, doesn't it? I mean, for, for a while, the government's been saying they'll bring in binding laws. But when you look at the detail, they hadn't set any ambition. They hadn't set which laws, they, uh, which areas they're going to bring it in for. So we're putting that specificity on the table for them. We've done the detail, but what we really need is to show people care. Uh, and we know that all those millions of people you were talking about before who get out and do the surveys and dig the wetlands and, and what have you all care. And so the one thing we can do in the policy world to translate that love of nature into laws on the page is get behind this petition now and let's make sure that the government knows that we're watching and that we want more than warm words this time to turn around the state of nature. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And of course, what people can do, we can sign that petition, State of Nature petition. You can find all the links to that on the comment section right now. It's really easy. And trust me, every signature does count. There's been research into petitions and they really do work. You need to show that you care. So please do add your name onto that ever growing list. Yeah, and share it as well. Pass yes. it on to your your friends and family and ask them to sign it too they don't have to be necessarily into nature you know bird geeks butterfly geeks botanical geeks in, in any way shape or form okay. but if they are people that go out for a nice walk on a sunday afternoon in a green space and they want that green space to still be mm. there in x years time do you watch a documentary about nature you know you know if you're not going out, whatever whatever connection that you have um just please sign it <laughs> we yeah. have a, a eternally grateful okay um, yeah. so you can uh, follow wildlife countryside link and their tag is at wcl underscore news wcl underscore news uh, you can follow richard of course while we're doing that rs benwell on twitter at rs benwell on twitter and as we say the uh, the link to the petition mm. is there please get signing if you can richard what's the rest of the day got in store for you we're going to be chasing turtle doves i think <laughs> oh well uh just down the road from here, there's some pretty uh, nasty pollution happening. So as a village, we're trying to get together to buy a bit of land that's been horribly degraded um, right next to an ancient woodland. So I'm going to go down there and take some pics and uh, try and rally the troops to see if we can save our little bit of Britain. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Excellent. What a great way campaigning. to spend an afternoon. Top work. <laughs> exactly. Oh, that sounds dear. great. Well, I feel guilty now. We're having a, a day no, off looking we're at we're, 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 we're oh, chill no. out. Where are you? We're, we're get on our bikes and come down and help out. <laughs> great Coxwell. That's where it's at. Okay. Uh, thanks so much for uh, all you're doing on this, guys. Really appreciate it. Not thanks, at all. Richard. Thanks for joining us, thanks Richard. For coming. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> See you soon. Now. Bye. I, I think it's really Aww. important that we... I know. No, I don't. I do feel guilty now, No, I do feel a bit bad. Top bloke, eh?
really good. Like, I feel like we should be doing something more Community productive. conservation like that, really important as but well. But it really works, doesn't it? When communities come together, whether it's to save a piece of land from development. I mean, we've seen it time and time again. You've got Kiddison Community Meadows, which we love, don't we? Yeah, we, we love that place. Uh, They bought this, you know, football field that was going to be turned into a development. It's on the side of an A road. And now it's just this buzz of biodiversity, beautiful meadow. Yeah. Um, and the community come there to enjoy it. And it's the most precious thing ever. It's lovely. Yeah. I was doing some stuff with the Heritage Lottery Fund recently. Um, and in the last 10 years, they've given 2.2 billion to projects like that. So if you do have, you know, an interested community and there are threats in your area, get together and think about applying for a grant from Heritage Lottery. You might get some money. Yeah. I mean, some of the grants are quite small, a few thousand pounds, but they're effective. And some of them are much larger. Um, and having access to that funding can be really important when it comes to looking after your, your space. And recently I was up on the uh, water meadows on the uh, Itchen. Oh, yeah. And there was a community that had come together there to do something very similar to Clitheston. Mm. They bought a meadow, an old water meadow, and they were out there flooding it in the traditional way. It was about 150 people. Mm. And I mean, the wildlife had improved on the meadows since they'd, they'd got their hands on it. But when I came away from it, what was most joyous was not actually seeing the kestrel hovering over that meadow as I'd seen <laughs> when I was a, a child, but was this throng of people having a great day out Aww. in their meadow. That's lovely. You know, that sense yeah. of ownership was yeah. just fantastic it brings people together doesn't it it's nice when people can do that to make yeah. a difference but uh, individuals yeah. and communities ultimately we should um, be doing everything we can every little counts these days of course but yeah. we still need our politicians to make you know broader and bigger decisions of the right kind and occasionally there are hints that they do shark fins been, yes they're talking about a ban on shark fin well, yes, sort of. Yes. So shark, it was a big news recently in the last couple of weeks, thanks to, you know, Shark Guardian, Shark Trust and lots of brilliant kind of NGOs working in that sector. Um, re up until recently, it was legal to bring in with you into the UK up to 20 kilograms of shark fin. It's a lot of sharks. It average, I think it's about five individuals of shark um, and it's about £6,000, I believe, you could, of shark fin that you were legally allowed to bring in, which just didn't really make any sense i mean there's something that i've been campaigning about for ages i'm really passionate about sharks i found shark fin soup on you know restaurant menus around the uk and it's a real big problem i recently did an investigation where i went to local fish and chip shops and i took samples dna samples from um, pieces of fish called rock salmon now rock salmon is an umbrella term um, it could mean many different species and when doing those dna analysis 100% of it came back as a species called um, uh, called spiny dogfish. This is a species which has declined by over 90% in UK waters, yet somehow it's still ending up being called rock salmon in our fish and chip shops. So, you know, we have a real problem in the UK with our sharks. Um, they are massively declining. We've got 40 species of sharks around the UK waters. We don't often appreciate just how biodiverse our marine environments are, but they are simply fantastic. So this ban, you know, bringing shark fin in is a real step forward. There's still a long way to go, as I said, with the spiny dogfish. And also kind of there's a little bit of legality around whether you can, you know, cut, um, bring the shark onto land and then cut its fin off or bring, you know. So there's different stages, but it's a step forward in the right direction. And not being able to bring in 20 kilograms of shark fin to the UK through borders is, you know, is a step forward. But we do need to see that implemented and we need to see the, re the response. The sooner, the, yeah, the sooner, sooner that happens. Than later. So it can work. It's been lobbying it for a while and it's a it's a real good step forward. Long way to go, as there is with a lot of different things. But hey, campaigning really, really does work. It does work. Now, yeah. I'd like to introduce you now to a man who I was fortunate enough to meet some time ago and work with on a number of different campaigns. He's a great listener. He's a great communicator. Uh, he's been a bridge between the public and politicians for a long time and an effective one, too. He's brilliant at working with young campaigners and conservationists. He was frequently inviting them to number 10 to meet people. Um, he's an all round top bloke I'm talking about Lord John Randall. Um, and he's now going to speak to us a little bit about the role that politics can play in this type of essential conservation. Over to John. I've been watching birds, looking at nature ever since I was a, a small boy and I can tell you that was some years ago. And although there's still plenty to see and I still get incredible enjoyment out of nature, it does depress me when I think of what we've lost. And I'm acutely aware of that because I look back through the notebooks I've kept over the years and I see how species have declined and some have disappeared entirely. But there is an opportunity for us to try and stop this decline in nature. I'm pleased the government has woken up to this and they've got the forthcoming Environment Bill 
which will be coming to the House of Lords quite soon. And what we need in that is a really meaningful state of nature target. Something that we can hold the government to, not just this government, but all future governments. And so that is going to be a really important thing to get in the bill. Now I'm going to be working quite hard with a lot of other uh, people from across the political divide and we're going to try and get that into the bill. And I'm quite hopeful that the government is listening. But just to make sure that they listen, I really need you to do something to help. To help me, to help those who want this target in and to help nature itself. And that is to sign the petition to get that meaningful target into the Environment Bill. And of course there's lots of other things we can be doing, but for those of us in, in, in Parliament this is important. Now I know to a lot of people politics, lawmaking seems boring, doesn't seem relevant, but I can assure you it is, because that's what defines the next years. So just please, please, please sign that petition and let's get that state of nature target into the bill. Thank you. Some very poignant points there. Yeah, Lord John Randall is an absolutely mm. top bloke, I've got to say. He has long been an effective liaison and a great champion for conservation. He's a very, very passionate birder at heart. I've got to tell you that as well. <laughs> he loves his patch. Yes. Um, you can follow him actually on Twitter. Um, Uxbridge Walrus. Uxbridge like Walrus. Why Walrus? Oh, I, I, I Why did you go for Walrus? I don't know, but I, I wanted to find know. out. I, I shudder I to think. I, I shudder to think. But <laughs> he is an absolutely top bloke. He's so approachable and um, and so friendly, and he's been mm -hmm. so supportive to so many of the things that people have been doing over the years. So, John, thank you very much for that. But keenly pointing out that in order to stop these centuries of decline, we do need government action um, to make it happen everywhere. And and you know. It's all very well saying we want government to do something, we, but we've been out there doing the groundwork. And when you think mm -hmm. of some of the species that we've got, we've been talking about turtle dove and corn crake and sharks th this morning. But in 1997, there were only 11 booming bitterns in the UK, 11 male bitterns booming in 1997. They were on the brink of extinction. Uh, uh, thanks to all sorts of uh, conservation work, um, now, 2016 was the last time there was a, a full count. Uh, there were 160 booming male bitterns. So that's quite a significant recovery, proving that we have the ability to understand the ecology of the birds, to reshape their environment, um, and, and sometimes reintroduce them. Um, yeah. Cell buntings, uh, again, you know, 1989, this farmland bird was down to 120 pairs of cell bunting in the southwest of England, a species that was once common all over the, the UK, uh, a, a bird which Beautiful. prospered on farmland when it wasn't intensively and industrially managed. Um, and again, thanks to an RSPB and Natural England uh, initiative, um, the last time there was a census of these, there were now a thousand of these birds. And you can see them regularly if you go down to the southwest and the south coast of, uh, of Devon. And now there are several populations where they've moved them apart. There's still a, a lot of work being done on corn, uh, sorry, cell bunting conservation. And a lot of that was down to country ship, uh, countryside stewardship schemes, which were introduced and a close working relationship that was forged with farmers to, in order to make that work. So, you know, that worked. And then we could go on and talk about red kites, but I think that yeah, one's been voluntarily really covered. Pretty... Everyone knows what a brilliant job a consortium yeah. of partners did starting in 1989 to bring this species mm. again back to be a familiar site over much of the UK now. So mm. we can do it. You know, we've got the capacity oh. to do it, yeah. but we do need to do it more broadly and more rapidly well it is getting there isn't it the one that's been in the news recently is of course the beaver now the beaver has been well was extinct from the uk for 400 years but thanks to reintroduction programs they are finally coming back we had that big success didn't we last year where they were allowed to remain in the river otter in devon which is incredibly exciting but they've got strongholds up in scotland and of course devon and cornwall the beavers are fundamental for the ecology of the uk they're ecosystem engineers they prevent flood fl uh, flood flow by 60 percent 60 percent which is so important particularly in a changing climate and as things start getting drier as they get warmer we need to have these areas with built-in moisture and that's exactly what beavers do so they're really important in mitigating the impacts of climate change but also carbon capture clean water i could go on about the benefits of beavers i won't because we'll be here for another couple hours but they're a fantastic species again a success story it shows that it can happen another success story short-tailed bumblebee yeah short-tailed bumblebee completely short-haired bumblebee sorry short i, keep, I always call them short-tailed 
I don't know why. The tails Every are perfectly time, reasonable They've length. got a reasonably length yeah, tail. Like... I always call them short tail. I, I have know. this thing. I, I did it before. You've got a glitch. Short hair. I've got a glitch. Yeah, that's that's right. I've got a glitch. A short head bumblebee, but they are a fantastic species. Um, officially declared extinct in the UK in 2000, but thanks to work from the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, they are on a comeback. And now 2,460 acres of land managed by landowners and farmers are really working hard to try and bring back the short head bumblebee. Yeah, which is great. And when we started off talking about the State of Nature Report 2019 and the plethora of impacts that are, you know, that are ringing out negative effects on that wildlife, one of the things that we talked about was industrial farming, basically mm -hmm. intensive farming and the changes in farming practices that we've seen, certainly since the end of the last war, more than, you know, 50, 60 years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, and those changes, again, have been seen since 1970. That's in my lifetime. Um, and they are having a significant effect. And that was one of the key factors, the key factors that was most widely spoken about in the wake of that report being published in 2019. So when 86% of our land surface is either farmed or forested, it's clear where we need to do quite a lot of the work. RSPB um, got to uh, think about this um, uh, quite a lot, obviously. And in 1999, they bought Hope Farm, which was a two kilometre uh, sized farm in Cambridgeshire. And by 2000, they'd started work there. The first thing they did was an audit. So they did a, a bio blitz basically to see what was on that farm. Um, I can tell you that the wheat production is up. The yield is up. Uh, the, the beans that they've been growing and the rape that they've been growing is holding its own with other farms in that part of the world. But the difference between Hope Farm and some of the other farms in that part of the world is that their farmland bird index, that's an index of the abundance of a range of species which we categorise as farmland birds, is up, get this, by 200%. Not bad, is it? 200% increase while still being a productive productive farm and i know that they're thinking about agroforestry which is what we've come what we're here to today. wakelands to to learn about this weekend but so tell us a bit more about that now is georgina bray georgina are you there i am hello and you're Hi. you're on hope farm this morning and 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 well firstly congratulations and top work 200 yeah. percent increase in farmland bird insects that that's something worth shouting about thank you thanks so much. I'm, I'm actually back at the farm at home um at the family farm today but I've, I've sat nice next to a nice hedge that gives the same kind of feeling as the hedges and stuff that we've got at Hope Farm. But oh, thank you very much, Chris. Tell, tell us a little bit more, Georgina, about you know what you've been doing now in terms of investigating ways of, of, of changing farming so that it is still productive, of course, because we've all got to eat. Um, um, but nevertheless, it's productive for wildlife too. Um, so we've been, well, we started off at the farm um, and it was, very ordinary, 180 hectares, um, wheat and all seed rate rotation. And we started off just by looking at the marginal areas of land um, because agricultural policies driven by government, they had gone for maximised production, um, removal of hedgerows, every corner, even if it's not great for cropping, would be put to crop land, um, which doesn't always make the most business sense because you can be spending more money to grow a crop than you would actually be to sell it. Um, than what you would make off of that land in um, income. So we started off taking out awkward corners, the headlands, so the edges of fields, making the most of them um, for hedgerows, wildflower mixes, seed mixes to keep birds going over winter. Um, and just really simple stuff, making sure that wildlife has food, nesting habitats, um, and a place to thrive. So try not to keep things too complicated and that already led to the increase by 2010 of 200 percent increase in breeding birds um, and that's without changing the farming practices in the middle which in itself is extraordinary but um, farming in the last 10 years as every farm will probably let you know it is getting really tricky and um, we've had a few really difficult seasons uh, but the decisions we've made to look to nature for the solution rather than going to the shed and getting the next chemical out to control a pest or disease or whatever actually makes the farm much more resilient um, so we're not going for the highest yield we're going for looking after the soil which is amazing for biology it's amazing for the worms the insects all of those things that birds feed on um, 
but it actually makes the crops more resilient as well to things like drought and floods looking after the soil um and which megan suggested too as well that makes things much better for carbon storage so it's all win. it's it's not straightforward all the time but it's certainly the way to go and the thing is that we meet luckily um lots of farmers doing great things we're Wakelands at the moment, great things have been happening here. This was an experimental agroforestry uh, farm for a long time. Now they're changing the way that they produce and distribute food here and exploring it's that. Remarkable. It's remarkable. Yeah. It's incredible. You know, talking about the different wheat varieties last night when we were eating some most amazing bread. Yeah. Absolutely most amazing bread. But it was incredible to learn because I didn't realise this before, but you go to different wheat fields across the country and it will be the same genetic variation. It will be identical across the country, every single type of wheat. And of course that leaves, you know, that crop incredibly vulnerable to disease and everything else that comes in it would just wipe them all out but to get that genetic variety and that mix in terms of our crops is really important and that is a direct link with biodiversity no you're right there's something that we're learning more and more um so to start off with at the farm it was very much we had the real nice wildlife habitats around the edge which is great but the center of the field was still very industrial um but actually the more diversity you have across the farm the more it resembles an ecosystem and so the more stable it's going to be um, when we bought the farm it was just wheat and all seed rape so that's two habitats that you've got there um, wheat is good for some species and all seed rape can be great for reed buntings and skylarks quite like it and it can be lots of insect food um, but as soon as you diversify for to different crops so the beans they're great for yellow wagtail and lapwing when you have spring barley that's so much better for skylarks um, and you can have cover crops in there over winter which is another kind of habitat um, and you've got all of these different root structures that suit different species that we can hardly see without a microscope as well um, and that is the same kind of vein as with the different wheat varieties we've got different varieties across our farm although conventional ones because there'll be different susceptibilities to disease um, it's there's lots of different things you can do and you can make it increasingly complicated uh, we went over to Wakelands a couple of weeks ago to learn about agroforestry ourselves for something that we want to explore um, but just the one thing that we really do keep saying is that you need to have that diversity to have that stability to buffer the business if one crop doesn't go well you'll have four other different crops but also so you're not just relying on the same solutions which always if you don't have all of those cultural things going on um, it will end up being the pesticides and things that aren't great for the environment either. Georgina I think there's one thing we need to be really clear here we're, we're not being anti-farming in any way shape or form we're, we're going to get up in a minute and go and have something to eat and someone's going to have to produce that for us and then so, we're going to go walk around the farm yeah you know uh, obviously we, we meet lots of people I, we're going to be broadcasting spring watch from wild ken hill um i've been up there and look, looked at that there's some rewilding going on there but it, the working part of the farm looks to be a lot healthier than some nature friendly farming nature network friendly farm. martin lines yeah you know and then the, the NEP, obviously, farm, a friend of mine, Henry Edmonds at Childerton. I mean, the list goes on. There are lots of farmers out there doing great things to, you know, for the landscape and all of the wildlife that, that's there. Um, we just need to communicate that to the broader farming movement, I think, don't we? Yes, yes, in a way. And it, it's very exciting that the message is changing and there are more and more farmers who are looking to focus uh, not just a small portion but I think quite a large portion of farmers are looking to the soil and seeing how they can improve it and looking at that as a way of remaining resilient more farmers going into the voluntary stewardship schemes um, countryside stewardship that you mentioned um, and this is not to say that we're getting it perfect at Hope Farm at all there are lots of other farmers who are doing amazing things perhaps even more innovative than what we're doing at Hope Farm um, but it is so useful for us to have that monitoring to go alongside to really quantify the difference it can make for wildlife. Um, but where I was going with the countryside stewardship is at the moment, it's very much a voluntary scheme. Um, and it does add another bit of admin for the farmer to do in the business. From having 
not a higher level, so not a really high level stewardship, but a mid tier basic stewardship scheme at Hope Farm. We managed to make those differences for wildlife. So if that was something that was rolled out across the three quarters of the land that is farming in the UK, it it could just make such a huge difference. Absolutely. One of those policies and that support in place. On the work that you do at Hope Farm, Georgina, honestly, it's incredible. Thank you so much for doing it. And it's been so interesting learning about yeah. it all. It's so, it's so complicated, but yet so simple in the same way. It's kind of going back to the roots of farming, what farming used to be going back a few hundred years ago. And it's um, you know, productive for everyone. Exactly. You can find out more about Hope Farm um, on the RSPB website, of course. Uh, there's plenty of information there. And you can follow uh, Georgie, uh, Georgina as Georgie Wild Bray. Georgie Wild Bray mm-hmm. on Twitter. Uh, Georgie, Georgina, thanks very much for joining us uh, uh, this morning. Right, what's the way? Are you going out birding today or are you hard at the conservation, you know, grindstone like Richard Benwell is? Um, so today I'm out on the farm just enjoying time here but tomorrow we are off um me and my colleague are doing an early morning farm and bird survey on our neighbor's farm um to hope farm because he wants to see what what or what birds and species he's got out on his land so we'll be up early there and looking forward to what we see Excellent. sounds great top work we'll have a great day out tomorrow morning and thanks for joining us thank today. you so much Cheers, thank, thanks very much bye 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 so we've got to do it for wildlife but we mustn't forget that we're doing this for people too oh it is they're interconnected people and wildlife are one of the same you know we're not out of the system we're very much inside that system and we are all connected you know if we're losing species we're you know ultimately impacting ourselves at the end of the day isn't it but people are becoming so connected to nature now more than ever i think throughout the course of lockdown people were seeing things that they'd naturally just walk past every day you know you'd walk outside of your front door you'd walk past the birds the dandelions the hedge whatever and you'd be in the car on your way to work and wouldn't think twice about it now though people have stopped they've had a bit of a breather They've kind of almost reset and they've noticed the birds. They've noticed the life in the hedge or they've noticed the dandelion and they've seen things a little bit differently. And it's been amazing the kind of connection that people have found throughout the course of the year. And whether that is kind of going to your local garden, your green space, of course, people noticed that they thought the birds were singing louder. Mm. There's been lots of studies done in this because that was noted all over the place. 74% of people surveyed thought that the birds were singing louder or that they noticed the birds more. And actually what it was is the birds weren't singing louder. It was the fact that there was no anthropogenic human-made noise. Therefore, it sounds like they were. But one interesting fact that yeah. is really cool is that actually they looked at the details of bird songs and it wasn't that the birds were singing louder. It's that their songs were becoming more complex because they weren't being drowned out by that anthropogenic noise. And then Therefore, they could invest more energy in more complex songs. So they were adding more notes to their songs rather than making them louder. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's top, isn't it? There you go. And a lot of the time this morning, we've been talking about what you might consider the wilder parts of the UK, the countryside, the farms we've been mm-hmm. talking about and other places. But we've got to remember that wildlife prospers in our towns and cities too. Um, there were plenty of uh, nature reserves in town and cities, green spaces, um, even municipal parks can play a role if they're managed in, in the right way. And to prove that that's the point, we've now got Kay Brennan from the Wildlife Trust telling us a little bit about some urban nature reserves. Here's Kay. My name's Kay and I work with the Wildlife Trust. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you this morning, but instead I've come to Woodthorpe Meadows, which is a teeny tiny nature reserve managed and cared for by Nottinghamshire Wildlife Trust. Where we are right now is just off a really, really busy A road and the other side of us is a busy ring road that leads out of Nottingham City. Probably about a mile and a half from Nottingham City Centre. We're surrounded by houses and people in a very urban environment. And we're right next to a very popular community centre. But this place is thriving. It's also raining, but it's thriving. And that's because of the kind of attention that it gets from people like us. We are making sure that areas in this tiny space are given over to wildflowers to make insects more welcome. And across the county, we're also making habitats more welcome for the white-tailed crawfish and also for the grizzled skipper butterfly, two species that are under great risk. They're on the red list, which means that they're very vulnerable to extinction. Wildlife trusts know that with good management and the right care and support and proper resources, nature can recover in places like this. And not just places like these, all over the country in different parts and pockets and areas 
we need to see nature recovering from our streets to our shores. Those areas need to be connected and protected and properly made into a network that covers the whole of the UK. So we were really pleased to know that the Environment Bill would be the first law to put nature's recovery into a priority. And also we were pleased to hear the government say recently that the Environment Bill would include targets to make sure that nature's recovery can begin before 2030. It's so crucial to make sure that starts now for people's benefit as well as for wildlife's benefit. And we benefit when wildlife is healthy. But it's also incredibly hopeful to know this is in our grasp. So we want to make sure that we don't take our foot off the pedal. We want to see those warm words turned into action and ultimately into law. And so keep supporting the State of Nature campaign. Keep helping us to share that petition get behind what it is that the Wildlife Trust and other NGOs are trying to do with the Environment Bill. We will soon see a nature recovery network and a wilder future for everyone. Thanks very much for that, Kay. I mean, I hate to say it, but I'm going to do it anyway, what? because I do it all the time. What? Um, if you build it, they will come. <laughs> if you true. are Kevin Costner, I've well, never seen you making a baseball field. You don't even know what baseball is. You I could... know what baseball is. What, I can't it's a play bunch it. of blokes hitting a ball with a bat. I can't play it because I have no hand-eye coordination, so it would just be a disaster. But, you know, I like that. I like that phrase. I know, it's but a, it's true when it, it comes true. to nature. If you build it and get it there, then they do come. And it's so important that we do these small actions all the time, you know, whether it's our gardens, whether it's our communities or online, we can all do something to make a difference. And right now you can go and sign the petition, uh, State of Nature petition. All the links are in the comments. Please do sign it because every signature counts honestly they all do make a real big difference you know no voice and is too small we need you all yeah pass it on to yeah. friends and family knock on your neighbor's door yeah you yeah. know not go round, go round. you know just you ask know, everyone your milkman your postman two meters apart lean over the fence yeah. ask them to uh, ask them to sign up be to. safe of course and, and i think sharing that passion is really important isn't it really if you do something mm. in your garden if you're lucky enough to have one and then you know ask your neighbor to do the same you know show them the benefits of that uh, georgina was just talking yes. about she's going around to the neighboring farm to count the birds there and maybe the farmer will be peering over the, the hedge and thinking well oh, they've got 200 percent increase in their yeah. farm i fancy a bit of that myself yeah exactly but then you could do that in your own gardens you don't have to have a farm to no, do it exactly. you could go and say do you mind if I put a hedgehog highway in you know a little hole it has to be about 13 centimeters the size of a cd case great for hedgehogs but also amphibians and everything else as well and obviously you know you've got fences in the way nothing can move across so by putting small holes in your fences it's pretty good isn't it you're gonna get loads more wildlife in there boy barry Oi. Look, hey barry come Oi, on barry. look at this get barry Barry or Oi, Sheila, Baz. right? To Baz. look over, look over the fence. Look at my pond I've put in. Got newts, mate. Got, oh. got, got frogs. Have you, what, have you got newts over there? No. Oh, you should look and at then my Barry place. and Sheila might want a pond. I mean, it, share the love is what we're trying to say, isn't it? Yeah. Share the love and share the passion for, for exactly, wildlife. Exactly. And one person who shares the love and shares the passion and tries to get many people motivated mm -hmm. to improve uh, the wildlife in the UK. Because the UK, you know, we've been talking about it being the most nature depleted, well, not so, <laughs> most nature depleted countries in the world. Mm -hmm. Also, doesn't have a lot of forest left about 13 no. percent forest cover in the uk you know when you can think france has got 39 percent. we are the most deforested country yeah. in western europe so our woodland environment is really important looking after that that we've got and of course hopefully growing a bit more for the future so to tell us a bit more about that is the right man for the right job at this point mm -hmm. it's uh, darren morkoff from the woodland trust darren are you there um, hi to nice to see you. Uh, Good morning, Darren. Good morning, Darren. Uh, <laughs> Darren, morning. before we start, just in case everyone's been living under a stone in Greenland for the last 20 years, tell us a little <laughs> bit about the Woodland Trust and, and, and what it does. So the Woodland Trust is has the privilege to be the UK's largest woodland conservation charity. So we own and manage about 1,200 woods across the UK that are free access to anybody, regardless of where they live. Uh, and we also help uh, individuals, communities, businesses and landowners to integrate trees into their lives uh, and bring that joy that uh, trees and other wildlife can really bring. It's a really interesting conversation, isn't it? And it's been one that has been kind of a hot topic amongst politicians, actually, is this idea of reforesting, planting trees to help with the climate crisis. And of course, that is a brilliant idea and we all need to be planting trees. But it's really important that they're the right trees and that they're the right trees planted in the right places, isn't it? Absolutely. I think the, you know, the definition of the right tree in the right place is really getting resonance now. And it's, it's really great because it's been a maxim of the 
Woodland Trust for many years. You know, we're nearly 50 years old now. And uh, some of those trees that have been planted through that 50 year period are really coming into their own. So they can generate a habitat almost straight away by providing something for uh, in terms of diversity. But over the years, uh, they can create real habitats, which will create real communities of nature for people and for the wildlife themselves. And you're very keen, uh, Darren, uh, uh, the Woodland Trust, on community tree planting programmes. And you've got, you sell trees very cheaply, I have to say. And I bought some of your trees and they're all growing. So they work as well. <laughs> um, and, and that's very much part and parcel of the way you see these sorts of projects working, isn't it? It's not necessarily just government and it's not just individuals like me buying your trees, but it's people coming together with a, a collective purpose to, to reforest our landscape. Absolutely. I think one of the things I'm most proud of what the Woodland Trust does is it enables people to make their difference. So, you know, we do free school uh, trees, free school, uh, sorry, free community trees. Uh, and it's just opened uh, this week, actually, for, for a new set of schools and communities to, to go to the Woodland Trust website and apply to get their free trees. We, we provided 1.1 million last year. We want to provide 1.6 million this year because... And it's a stat that kind of shocks me when I heard it. You know, as you mentioned, Chris, the 13%. That puts us alongside the, the likes of Somalia for the amount of trees that, that we have in this country. And I think, you know, as a desert state, you, you kind of feel like we should have more. And I certainly feel we should have more because of the benefits they bring. You know, the, they clean the air, they clean the water that we drink, they provide uh, a real opportunity for creating the food that we eat. Uh, protecting our soils. I know you've spoken to at Hope Farm. It's a place that's close to my heart. Uh, I think the you know nature really is the kind of solutions to a whole range of problems that we currently face, uh, and we've seen that with reports like the Dasgupta report to to Treasury, showing the real value of nature and making sure that we both value it for its what it delivers for humans, but also its intrinsic value. When it yeah. comes to our trees, I mean, people, if you're lucky enough to be the custodian of a tree, I, I, I struggle with the idea of owning a tree, particularly when that tree was already old when I came across well, it. It's, and it's going to be a lot older when I'm long gone. So yeah. you know, we, we're like custodians of trees. Um, we should look after them a lot better at those that are already, you know, in, in their, you know, early, mid or late age. And, and, and it pains me no end to drive around the country and see people doing hideous things to trees. Yeah. Uh, you know, you wouldn't do it to an ancient building. Why would you do it to an ancient tree? Absolutely. I, you, know, you know, we we really feel passionately about the fact that these things are irreplaceable. You know, I had the priv privilege of going to, to one of our sites that 30 years ago was, uh, was an arable farm with a few pockets of ancient woodland. Uh, and the community came together. They planted new trees. They created wildflower meadows. And I stood there just this week listening to nightingales singing. And you kind of, you know, there's no price you can put on that, but all you can say is actually, I just want everybody to be able to experience it because it's uplifting. It helps our you know, mental health and well-being. And in the, you know, we've just been through Mental Health Awareness Week and really the uplifting nature of hearing any bird song, but you know, particularly a nightingale that has declined by 90%, was nowhere near that, uh, that area for, very, for a very long time, has now come back. And that's all because somebody actually uh, planted some trees and thought about the people who would come after them and I just happened to be the person who came after them to enjoy it well yeah it's fantastic stuff it isn't is. it it's brilliant stuff but it does massively boost your mental health and I was like you I said earlier on I was listening to Nightingales myself have a listen to this everyone listening at home and boost your mental health a little bit mm. here we are Yeah. You can hear the trilling. Fantastically rich, isn't it? It's so high. And and down if if those communities across the country came together, we've talked about this morning the ability to apply from grants from Heritage Lottery, Lottery Fund, other funding is available, help from the Woodland Trust, of course, with yeah. your free trees in certain circumstances, then those nightingales, they could bounce back and they could be, that sound that Megan's just heard as a privilege could be something that we could all hear every day. Absolutely. I think the, you know, it's, well, hope is the real word for it because I think the, both hearing it gives hope, but actually the ability, we have solutions. We know what works. 
we have to play our part. You know, we can plant trees, we can put up bird boxes, we can go out and help, you know, your, your local conservation organization to, to play its part. Or if you're lucky enough to have a garden, do your bit. But we also need government to do its bit. And as you said, the, you know, we wouldn't put uh, some of the infrastructure that's been talked about with government through St. Paul's Cathedral. So why put it through an ancient woodland that stood there for just as long, but is doing a fantastic job for the society? Exactly yeah, right. Precisely. Exactly right. Dan, thank you very mm. much for joining us this morning. Obviously, check out the Woodland Trust. If you're not a member, yeah. think about becoming a member. Think about getting a tree. And if you want the trees, you have to be quick because although Dan's you know, hoping to come up with 1.6 million trees this year, there's a great demand for them. It's fantastic, Dan, to get them going into schools, particularly having yeah. young people engage with the idea of planting a tree. So top work with that i hope you managed to get your 1.6 your 1.6 million trees out this year that would be fantastic um you can follow um darren on uh, at wt underscore darren on twitter at wt underscore darren on twitter check out the degusta report as well das gusta uh, so i get that right now das gupta report as well which you can find online and of course there were many recommendations darren was talking about their mental health awareness week there were many recommendations that came out of that yeah. and it was last week or week before i can't remember yeah there we are okay darren thank thanks you very, very much, much indeed darren. thank you thank you bye-bye there's so many things that we can all do isn't there you but know the one thing we want people to do at this point is sign the petition please Please. sign the petition what this morning is all about please sign the state of nature petition we it's need to send out really a clear message to this government uh, which will re remain for future governments because this program of work that we require the degree of protection that we require for and the impetus that we require to rebuild and restore our wildlife uh, needs to be voted for by a large number of us citizens we need to show them that we count and that we care and one very simple way to do that is to sign that petition it just takes a couple of minutes if that uh, if that if that and we all do care so um you know every every signature we are incredibly grateful for and it goes a real long way it really really does so um please sign it if you have thank you very much click share equally as important as signing it you know share it around and uh, hopefully we'll get that number up yep. deliver that to government and hopefully those policies that we were talking about earlier they're fantastic promises that are coming out but we need to make those action and we need to make them happen so um every signature is a step closer to achieving that yeah okay thank you very much to all of our guests for joining us this morning uh lord john randall yes Darren, yeah. uh, was just right. there with us Kay, yeah. georgina yeah yes, thank you very much for everyone for, for joining and of course richard benwell from yeah. wildlife countryside link yes. who are overseeing this initiative top work and particularly to richard because we feel guilty now because we're going to be swarming around learning about agroforestry looking for turtle dust. enjoying ourselves we're going to be enjoying ourselves and not working popping down to the local community to document some hideous environmental damage to motivate that community to put it right and, and i'm feeling bad no i know well i'm sure we can make it up we have to do something we'll do something this afternoon that's productive okay <laughs> and if you're members of the south by cycling bird club we'll see you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock yes. for the last of our broadcast which will be a program packed with nostalgia it, oh, it's gonna be, i'm gonna be emotional oh stop it stop i it. am okay yeah. it'll be and good course, in the All intro right. period come on get that petition signed get signing everyone on behalf of the uk's wildlife sign that petition have a good weekend see you soon bye-bye